And with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Laurent Bécu Renard uh, to answer questions or comments from the audience. Courageous it is of these men to share the stories, you know, with each other in group is something, but but then with you know the world and, and then a film and wondering were they all into it in, in the beginning? Was there reluctance or how was that process of between filmmaker and, and subject of building trust so they could feel comfortable telling the story? I did an extensive um, scouting and research for three to four years beforehand. I wanted to. Uh, to learn uh, exactly what would be the language of these guys, what would be exactly the experience. I met countless veterans and their families over the years and therapists. And when Fred opened the center, I had known him for three years already. He, he had been working with Vietnam War veterans for 25 years at the time. And uh, I asked him if I could be there before even the first patient came. And so uh, the first five months, uh, I was there with no camera. Uh, participating in everything and um, when after five months I started with a small camera um, I had already worked on a first film uh, a long time ago on women and the outcome of the war and the legacy of the war it was shot in Bosnia after the war and it was shot in therapy as well and uh, my idea at the time and it was the same for this one was that all this would make sense only if the camera would play an active role in the therapy process and so I started shooting with a small camera like we all have just to show that the camera would take its place in, 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 in the room and after a few weeks of that we started shooting with real, real professional equipment uh, over nine months of therapy and um, the guys you've seen in the film uh, when they arrived at the halfway home I had already started shooting with the real camera so there was never like a before and the therapy without a camera for them. You know, I, I wouldn't have done that, you know, to just arrive in the course of a process and uh, start filming. It would, wouldn't be good, wouldn't be possible. And, um, but of course it was not compulsory. And at any time they could tell us, uh, you know, just <laughs> take the door or sh shut the camera down. But it never happened. Uh, and it never happened in Bosnia 10 years prior with the women. Um, you know, there are many reasons why the camera is taking an active role on the therapy, but um, the main one I think is recognition and validation of the trauma by someone who is complete, a complete third party, coming from very far away, not only geographically, but culturally, socially, uh, with a perfect stranger who has no, uh, who has nothing to do with what was at stake in the war they were in. And, um, and by not having an agenda of questions, just listening to their questions, it's also validating that everything they have to ask themselves, everything uh, they have to say, has a value. And uh, this is emphasizing the attention the therapist himself is giving to what they have to say. And then down the road, uh, there's the promise of a story, a story that would be for them, a story that would be for their loved ones, the community they belong to, and then community of mankind, that is to say that from the very beginning, all of you are included in that group, and they know it perfectly. And you see how lonely they are with that trauma, and uh, they need to tie new bonds with uh, people, and, and that's how the camera is also playing a role in, in therapy. And further, after this nine months of therapy, over the next four years, we went to the families. All what happened in the families was shot afterwards. And sometime, three months went by, six months went by, nine months, 18, 24. But the day we would arrive, the day we would turn on the camera, they would pick it up where they had left it in the therapy room, three, six, nine, 18, 24 months before. That is to say how much they associated the camera with the, ther the therapy that was taking place in the room. And on top of that, a triangle, a therapeutic triangle, started in the family between them, the member of the family that was there, the wife, the parents, or the kids, and ourselves. And they would say things to each other because the camera was there. And so the camera played many, 
many in many ways that the role in the firm. Uh, and nine months in therapy is very, very long. You know, we were shooting up to 10 hours a day. You know. There's also one aspect of that, which is most veterans are in denial of the trauma itself. And, you know, as you were saying, it's very courageous of them to, um, to go for five months on average. Some, some of them stay longer, but, uh, but let's say five months on a daily basis. Um, facing the wound, the inner wound, the psychological one, and, uh, and working on it, you know, and uh, not every single veteran is able to do that. And it's, uh, and in many respects, that's why the guys you've seen tonight, uh, they're only representing themselves. Not as far as trauma is concerned, because as far as trauma is concerned, they're representing everyone. But that, as far as the fact that they're facing it, and, and I think they're conscious of that, and it's also one of the reasons, perhaps, they accepted to be filmed, to help their peers, you know, their brothers of arms. And, um, and so, um, they're kind of sentinels, I would say, or avant-garde of, uh, of the, the three million who went to war in either Iraq or Afghanistan, out of which uh, the DOD, Department of Defense, think at least one third have PTSD. One million. This is almost frontline therapy, you know. Uh, and uh, these guys, when they reach the pathway home, are really on the borderline, you know. And they, but they have a desire to leave. That's why they ended up in therapy. But at the same time, the attraction towards towards death is, is just, you know, is unbearable. And uh, all what you've witnessed in therapy is 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 kind of a, it's almost a, it's a war zone inside themselves, and you can feel it physically. And Fred uh, knows that this five months on the bridge might be the only occasion in their life uh, to do some work on, on the trauma. So he's trying on a daily basis to find places where they can root themselves in life. You know? But he's never promising any, Ill, any cure. I don't think there is any cure for that. You know? They will have to live with it all their life long and learn how to live with it and, and learn how to live with the man they have become. And that's what he's trying to do with each and every one of them. And, um, but what I can say is that, of course, we, we lost one, uh, Chris. And over the halfway open in 2008, um, it's the only one um, that they've lost. And, um, and when we, uh, we, we showed the film to, to them, on a, we had a private screening for them. Uh, Half of them showed up. The other one, they said, you know, they want to see it on their own. Uh, you know, they were not ready to. But um, what they said after the, the screening, we spent an afternoon together. That is that uh, not only they could see where they came from, uh, seeing the film, but also um, how put into a film, which in many ways is a story. You know, because uh, we shot for 500 hours over the course of many years and we make a story of two hours and 22 minutes. This is cinema, but it is a story. And a story that we built like they were building up a story in therapy themselves. Going to therapy is inventing a story to comfort you, to help you live with what happened to you. And they could see that on screen and they could see it was making a meaning. And it could make a meaning for some other people. And that was very helpful for them to realize that, yes, they, they have built up a story that helps them live with it. And also, most of them said that they remember Pathway, the time at Pathway, as the first, the first time they were kind of, not at peace, but, you know, it was, it was kind of a, the end of the fall, you know, because they were just falling down before going to, to Pathway. And that's how they see their experience there. And, but, you know, they have ups and downs that it will be all their life long. Uh, you're in the therapy as well, and so what were the consequences on yourself, and how did you uh, process, process what you were witnessing and filming? You're facing people who, who, whose experience was death, not only witnessing, uh, but also the fact that they can kill, or they did kill, or the fact that they could be killed anytime. 
Uh, and this is this is taking a lot of energy outside of myself. But I had a quest, which is, uh, you know, I was really seeking for what was the legacy within my own family and in myself, and what my grandfather could have said if they had been in capacity to say anything. And I think that they had transmitted everything, like all of us in the Western world. We have, I mean, we have the same kind of stories over the, the course of the 20th century. And so, so was my quest. And at least that helped a lot, you know, because I knew why I was really doing that. And um, I can say that now that the film is achieved, um, well, uh, I'm one step uh, forward in, in that respect. And, um, you know, the, the trilogy is called a genealogy of rap. Uh, because to me, the, the main legacy over the, the course of the 20th century of the experiences of war uh, is that the societies we belong to are very angry, and we are all very angry, and we most of the time we even don't know why. And I think a lot of that anger and wrath is coming from the, the experience of war, and I think after these two films, and especially this one, uh, as, as Justin would, would say, I feel a little bit less angry. What qualifies someone to go to the pathway home, and how do they find out about it? People just apply, and uh, there's no psychiatrist in the, at the pathway home, so whomever is really a uh, psych psychiatric case uh, will be uh, directed to uh, a place that would treat that kind of uh, patient. So, but everybody can you know can apply. It's free. It's a nonprofit, and uh, one of them punched and destroyed a wall in the corridor. And, uh, well, not only I didn't witness anything uh, really worse than that, uh, I saw chairs going through the windows or, you know, uh, at night sometimes. Or, but I think we feel the rage uh, physically uh, on their face, uh, you know, on their body. And, uh, and I think it's even more powerful. And, uh, I kind of belong to this kind of cinema that doesn't need to show things. You know, I I'm really I really trust the audience to uh, to you know to do their their own work and uh, with a film. And I think it's much more powerful in terms of cinema. So had I witnessed or had I filmed, it's not sure I would have edited in the film such an, an, an event. The approach to therapy that's used at this facility, but uh, I, in a sense that the, the wives themselves will also show symptoms of post-traumatic stress. I didn't really film that because I always wanted to, I kept only one scene uh, with a couple that we see in uh, one of the last therapy sessions they had, because uh, I, I wanted to, that we keep always the point of view of the man, and uh, including when we shoot in, in the family, uh, I use on purpose uh, 35 millimeter lenses because for them it's it's kind of a fictional moment to be in with the family. Of course they're there physically, but they're somewhere else. They're they're on the front line and not necessarily the Iraqi or the Afghani front line, but the inner front line. And um, but that's you know so I was always I wanted to, always to be from the point of and every one of them. And, uh, I didn't want to document uh, PTSD. I, I wanted to, to tell the story from the inside. First of all, why choosing America? For me, uh, it was not only the fact that America was at war massively when I wanted, decided to make the film. Not only that America had been working on PTSD for a long time, and Fred had been one of the pioneers of uh, tr treatment with PTSD. But also, I think each and every one of us, most of our representations of the warrior are coming from Hollywood. And not that Hollywood has an agenda, but it's just producing so many films on war. And most of these films are very epical, heroical. And we, I mean, I grew up with this kind of film since uh, the 60s. And I mean, the more I was seeing them and when I became uh, an adult, I, could, I couldn't stand anymore this kind. I knew there was something, it was deceiving me. There was something of the experience of war that I was bearing as a, you know, uh, with the family 
family legacy that was not in those films. And so the idea of going to America to make this film was also to take guys that look alike, these heroes of Hollywood movies, and, and, sh and show the other side. And, and, sh and show that heroism is, uh, is also to face the wound and the trauma. You know? Even if movies that were against war, uh, you know, like post-Vietnam movies, uh, a lot of the time they're heroical movies. And, uh, and so that's one thing. This, the second thing is that uh, I think the distance, being, being French in an American environment, helped it's a paradox, but it helped the proximity with the guys very much. So as I said before about therapy, the fact of being a perfect stranger, a third party, uh, helped this, my presence in the therapy room. And it works both ways. You know, um, I was not disturbed by their language. Perhaps an American filmmaker would have been disturbed and would have think, my God, these guys, or, you know, I didn't have any preconceived ideas on them. And, uh, you know, and they could feel it. You know, and that I, I was not judgmental, and perhaps it's, it would have been much more difficult had, uh, had we been from the same country. If I had filmed this this, this film in France, uh, I might have had preconceived ideas on French military, for instance. You know? And just a last comment on that is that uh, again we had a lot of veterans in France coming to. I did 140 Q and A's, and a lot of veterans from Algeria from. Uh, even recent wars, and all of them, when they take the floor during the Q&A, they say, this is my story. You know, they don't care it's been shot in America, or they don't, they see it's exactly that. And sometimes there's a, an old lady saying, I've been living with one of these men for 50 years, and he wouldn't say anything. And he's exactly like the guys I've seen in the film. And that's, that's how I, I got him back after the war in Algeria. So, yeah, that's what I can answer. We truly care for these people on screen. It's a very long film, but it's not. It, we're, with it, we're with them through the film, and uh, they all seem like really beautiful people like in their hearts, and it, and it really comes through. I think that's a, a great feat on the part of the We had a, a screening two days ago in, um, in Youngville, where the, the film is shot. It just, you know, uh, on, it's on the premises on a huge campus, and there's a cinema there, and there was a huge audience. Uh, one of, one of the guys was there and he, he took the floor and it was very touching because everyone there was uh, listening for the first time. They knew that place, it was next door to them. They were even funding it uh, because it's a non-profit and, and they had no idea there was something going on there. And one of these guys said, uh, you know, I, I'm really grateful because he was not in the film, but he said, uh, I have, this film is giving me a voice and a voice for the people around me. So they 